Welcome to the Scarlet Faithful Podcast. I'm Aaron Brightman, and it's my pleasure to welcome back one of the uh, best announcers and personalities in college basketball today, John Fanta, who was on the call for Rutgers Seton Hall this past Saturday. John, thanks so much for being here. Aaron, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me. And what a win for the Scarlet Knights on Saturday night in the Garden State Hardwood Classic. They painted jersey scarlet and black on Saturday evening. That was a very impressive performance, and it was a thrill to call with Jim Spinarkle. We treat this rivalry with the grace and respect that it deserves, and I thoroughly enjoyed watching Rutgers live on Saturday night. I think we saw what is possible for this team in that two hours. Totally agree with you, and uh, both of you had a great call once again. It definitely elevates the game for those watching at home. Uh, I was as well, just to have two guys. You're an honorary Jersey native now, uh, but been, been in the state a long time, and obviously Jim Spinarco, but you guys did a great job just uh, giving the importance that this game really had. Um, I wanted to start with asking you uh, in your pregame talks with Steve Peichel, uh, kind of how you felt he was uh, feeling about his team going in, obviously two subpar performances, and, and how much he was really uh, focusing and prioritizing uh, their performance coming into this game? Well, when we asked him what would be the key if, if we were talking to him at 1040 on Saturday night and his team had come away victorious, what will have happened? And he said, we will have come together. We will be connected. And I thought that played out in Saturday night's game. We can get into the analytics and numbers and figures throughout the course of a game all we want. But I think more than anything, Rutgers was not playing connected team basketball in their losses to Illinois and Wake Forest. They were disjointed. And that's really indicative in how you look at the Wake Forest game where you fall behind 18-3. to Then at one point you go on a 12-0 run. Then you're within a possession and Wake Forest goes on an 18-0 run. So lulls. And I think what Peichel was looking for Saturday night was how do I sustain how do I get a five out there that's going to sustain? And at the end of the day, he found the right combination by starting Jamichael Davis, giving him his first career start. I thought that allowed Noah Fernandes to let loose a little bit as a scorer, and it seemed like they had the right kind of vibe. But then bringing in Gavin Griffiths from off the bench, and then he sparks the team with his perimeter shooting, it was really impressive to see how that starting five of Fernandes, Davis, Amori, Andre Hyatt, and Moat Mag. Peichel said it to us shortly before Rutgers announced it, that Moat was going to play this game. And you just can hear in Steve's voice how much more confident he sounds knowing that he could put Moat Mag on the floor to cover whatever is needed to be covered defensively. Rutgers is a defensive-based program. They're tough. They're hard-nosed. That starts with Moat Mag. And I thought Steve was really, he was upbeat. For his team to lose back-to-back -back games the way they did, I sensed a real upbeat nature about him. And I thought that played out in the game on Saturday night. So we talked to him beforehand. He used the words connected and coming together. You need a glue guy to do that. Mawat Mag is a glue guy. And it even felt like that lifted Cliff Amore's confidence. Took the words right out of my mouth. I think the same thing, uh, just in terms of uh, what it did for Cliff's confidence as well, uh, in terms of, and, and he was a lot more aggressive. Uh, I think part of that was him understanding the importance of this game uh, from a rivalry standpoint, but also an urgency for this team, for him to be that guy that they need down low. I, I guess my question is, how sustainable do you think that this team, how they looked on Saturday with the new looks and the roster and the lineup being a little bit tweaked. Uh, how much do you think this sets them up now to evolve and emerge into a, a better team than they've been prior to this game? I think it totally sets them up. And I think that's why this game is always so good on the schedule because Seton Hall Rutgers typically comes the second weekend of December. And that's a perfect time of year for a pivot point in your season. You're a little more than a month in. You've been tested a little bit. But now you've got this rivalry game, and if you can win it, it really catapults your momentum and pushes it forward when you get closer to conference play. This was a sign for Rutgers of who they can be, of their identity. And, Aaron, I believe it is sustainable. I don't think that they're doing anything that's overcomplicated. I, I don't think – and that's not to say that they're not well-coached. They're incredibly well-coached. But the way that they play – 
that formula that you saw Saturday night, look, are they going to shoot 12 for 24 from three every time out? No, but how many teams are going to do that? I think it's all in process. And honestly, that to me, Saturday wasn't an outlier in who they can be as a perimeter shooting team. I think this actually has a chance to be one of Rutgers' better shooting teams if the pieces continue to align. The fact is, Gavin Griffiths is beyond his years. It feels like a sophomore or junior, at least out there, when he's cutting and making play. Andre Hyatt as a shooter has gotten better. Noah Fernandes showed he's made for the moment. So it's hard sometimes when you have a lot of new for the new guys to fit in seamlessly in games. I thought by the end of that game Saturday, Fernandes became the guy, a leader, someone they can count on time in and, and time out. And Pipo brought that up to us when we were talking in before the game. He said, look, Noah is a leader, but it's sometimes hard to gain credibility as a leader until you come up big in the big game. Well, Fernandes delivered the dagger shots, the dagger plays that led Rutgers to a win. And at the end of the day, Aaron, when you combine just – they don't need to be a great perimeter shooting team. But if they're a solid perimeter shooting team, that in turn will allow Cliff Amore to dominate games. That's the cliff they need every game. Maybe not that scoring line, but that aggressiveness. Right now, Cliff Amore is the best shot-blocking presence in college hoops. Yeah, great points. I, I think you said it earlier, too, in terms of uh, Jermichael Davis's presence, allowing Noah to play off the ball. I think that was huge for him, and I think it also helped the offense flow a lot better. Uh, they were sharing the basketball more. They were, you know, a little more strategic in how they were reversing the ball uh, and, and a little bit more dynamic in how they attacked. And I think they didn't prioritize Cliff as much in a positive way, and they let the game come to him a little bit better. Uh, and isn't it kind of interesting how, you know, a veteran guy like Noah needed the true freshman to step up and and have the, the ball in his hands to be able to open up things for him? How impressed were you were with Davis? And, and how much do you think this is going to be a jumping off point for him this season? Huge because for him as a freshman to make his first career start in a game of this magnitude and be composed, he doesn't turn the ball over. I mean, that that's just it with Jermichael. Like, you look at Saturday night. Now, he had two, but in his last four games, he's got 16 assists to two turnovers. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty sharp. And, and look, they've got a scenario here with Derek Simpson – that they've got to try to navigate their way through. And and I think, Aaron, sometimes sophomores do go through a little bit of a slump and then they eventually get out of it. He's going to be fine. Der Derek will be fine. And, and I think he'll end up being all right. I think that Steve's such a good coach. He's got such a good way about him. Derek's so full of upside that he'll, he'll bounce out of this. To me, though, you had to find someone who could be calm, cool, and collected. And for you to be able to call on a freshman to do that, that speaks volumes about your program. So Jamichael Davis was a steal for them, and he showed it on Saturday. He was beyond his years. I mean, if you look at the backcourt play, that, that's what impressed me the most about Rutgers' win. If you looked at Seton Hall going into the year, you would have said Kadari Richmond, now Amir Dots, Dylan Ade Wusu. Seton Hall's top 30 in Ken Palm experience. Throw it out the window. Rutgers' backcourt punked him. Yeah, and I think that we're seeing now the depth that we had hoped would be there starting to emerge uh, with different, you know, the, the, the guys that were able to step up on Saturday uh, with Steve being able to tweak the lineup, something that he rarely does during the season. Uh, but having that urgency, I thought he coached a great game. And I also thought a key spot in the game was I thought Shaheen Holloway made a great call early in the second half when Rutgers hit those two threes. He called the timeout and then all of a sudden the momentum shift shifted towards Seton Hall, and then Pico called the timeout 41-36, and they were in about a five-minute drought, and then all of a sudden they were able to get stops. And and I think Rutgers is always under Steve Pico. With their off they're at their best when their offense comes from their defense. How impressed were you were with the team defense in, in terms of Mawat Mag and what he brings on the defensive end for this team? Yeah, extremely impressed. I mean, Mawat Mag, for a guy who had not played, in 308 days, to come into his first basketball game that he's played in that long and play 24 minutes, start, play 24 minutes, pretty much fit in seamlessly. Aaron, would you have ever known 
that he hadn't played in close to a year. <laughs> no, and I was so impressed with how Peichel managed his minutes, too. I thought he got the most out of him. He never looked winded. No, he never looked winded, and he's in elite shape. He's, he's that type of athlete. He's got that type of length and versatility defensively. I'll tell you what. I, I really thought that it spoke so much about his presence. Sometimes teams say, this guy means a lot to us. Wait till you see him when he gets back. And then he gets back and you're like, well, does he mean that much to your team? No. When Rutgers finished last year 3-8, and eight, let, let's call it what it is. If Moat Mag is healthy for the remainder of the season, Rutgers goes to a third straight NCAA tournament. It's not even up for discussion. It was unfortunate that he got hurt. But he could be the very reason why they make a three out of four NCAA tournament appearances. Because he is the linchpin defensively. I was so impressed. I mean, I thought everybody fed off of that. From And, and Seton Hall had three shot clock violations in the first half of the game. That's team defense. That's commitment. That's guarding your man and making life difficult for the opponent. I thought Rutgers out-coached, out-schemed, out-defended Seton Hall, and, and it showed in the result. So Mag was really impressive. And, you know, I, I think it's the best testament when you're a guy who could come in after that long of a gap and play in that level, but also eight rebounds from a lot. Eight rebounds. And so for Rutgers, like Seton Hall out-rebounded them, but Seton Hall missed a lot more shots than Rutgers did. But for Rutgers, they had gotten now rebounded by a combined 40 against Illinois and Wake Forest. That didn't happen on Saturday. Rutgers showed as the game went on that they can rebound the basketball. And Mag had eight of those boards, eight of the team's 39. So you you can't – you couldn't have asked for a better return performance than what you got from Mawat Mag on Saturday. Yeah, and Rutgers was even uh, – they were like plus five pretty late in the second half. But Seton Hall, when they had that kind of comeback, they were able to get a lot of offensive rebounds. And uh, interesting, too, is Rutgers has lost their last four games at the rack in Big Ten play, none with Moat Mag. So I think that is also something yeah. to watch for moving forward in terms of the toughness he brings. Uh, obviously, you, you do a lot of Big East games, uh, but wanted to get your thoughts on the Big Ten as well. I know you've done some Big Ten games as well. Uh, and obviously with a field of 68 and all you do there, great work uh, with, with those guys. Um, how do you see the Big Ten right now? And do you think this is now an opportunity for Rutgers to, you know, they, they were picked 11th, uh, middle of the pack, but now they might have a chance uh, where I think it's kind of a wide open year, except for obviously Purdue and Illinois at the top. What are your thoughts on what you saw from Rutgers, what you know of the Big Ten and, and how you kind of see January starting to play out? Well, I, I think that this is a Rutgers team that finds its way at seventh in this league, maybe sixth, but I think anywhere between six and eight, Aaron. I, I, I'll be very surprised if they finish ninth or lower. I mean, I, I really mean that. I think this is a team. I'm not just saying that because I'm on your podcast. I'm saying it for a combination of a couple of reasons. Number one, now you've got Mag back. Your freshmen are only going to get better. Cliff Amore is one of the best bigs in America, and Saturday just felt like a season turner. The other reason is the Big Ten is not as deep as it's been. So I think there's a bit of an open door for Rutgers to step in and be in the middle of the conference standings, which can be enough to get you into the NCAA tournament. Look, Purdue is the clear one here. I think Illinois today is two. Wisconsin can be two. Wisconsin's there three. Northwestern should not be uh, discounted for. The win over Purdue was huge there. They're right around that four or five. Ohio State. You know, can you trust Ohio State? They lost to Penn State over the weekend. I thought I could trust them, but now I don't know. And and then you get into who can you trust in this league? Iowa is 0-2 in conference play. Michigan State's 0-2 in conference play. Rutgers would beat Michigan State if they played today. So the point is, Maryland, they've gotten off to a really rough start. The point is, is that this league is not as strong and as deep as it's been the last couple of years. But Rutgers has a formula that should be able to win a good amount of games, and they play in one of the toughest home court atmospheres. So the loss to Illinois really ain't that much of a bad mark. Illinois, to, to me, is a top 15 or so team in college basketball. You know, I think for Rutgers, beating Mississippi State's going to be big on December 23rd. It's a game that they really could use as well to almost offset some of your other non-conference results. You're at Ohio State. You're at Iowa. You're home to Indiana. You know, I'm not even going to the Michigan State game yet. 
But when you jump back into conference play at Ohio State, at Iowa, home to Indiana, you want to know what my thought process is with that? Get two of three. Come out two and two in your league. And then from there, you can go from there. You go to Michigan State, but then you host Nebraska. You know, the the, the defining stretch for this team is going to be that late January where they go back-to-back Sundays at Illinois, home Purdue. Uh, that's a real – that's a challenging stretch because then you go on the road to Michigan, you go on the road to Maryland. And Michigan's been all over the place, but that – and you think Maryland will probably evolve. That, to me, in late January – can this team salvage either a revenge opportunity at Illinois? I know it's going to be hard. Or can they pull off the giant slang chance against Purdue? And I think that's the interesting thing about the Big Ten this year. You're in a position where there aren't as many outstanding resume opportunities as there have been. So to me, that late January is really interesting because you get them back to back. Can you get one of those and be able to just hold float Avoid, you know, you don't want to lose to to Minnesota. Uh, you got to go to Minnesota this year. It'd be nice if if you could, you know, beat Ohio State, who you've got last. If you could be able to sweep them, you've got Northwestern at home. You don't have to go out there. So I think that the schedule is relatively manageable. Uh, you've got what two games against Nebraska. You want to be able to get a split with them. I actually think the Huskers are a big dance sleeper this year. I think that they could make the NCAA tournament. But overall, for Rutgers, they should be in the picture because, to me, they're better than Michigan. They're better than Michigan State. They're better than Iowa. They're better than Minnesota. They're, and then I think the middle of this league can always be a toss-up, but Rutgers is going to win at home more times than they'll lose. Mawat Mag being back now makes me feel more confident saying that. Yeah, I think for a lot of the reasons that you touched on, I, I'm obviously biased and optimistic, but I feel like this could be an opposite of last season where last season they started really strong. They were eight and four. They were in second place in the big 10 where this year, I think they're only going to get better as the year goes on and they have an opportunity to really make a run in the league down the stretch. Uh, and as you said, getting through that first part of January is going to be critical to doing that. Um, in terms of that Mississippi state game, a uh, great point on that in terms of the resume, uh, I guess, how important do you think, based on the lack of um, high-powered teams or, or high-ranked teams in the Big Ten, how important do you think the non-conference is going to be for all the Big Ten teams and how their resume is judged at the end of the year by the selection committee? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, if you look right now, I'm looking at this with you in real time. For this league, they have a huge upcoming Saturday. You know, Indiana gets Kansas at home. Honestly, Kansas has struggled from the perimeter. That's a golden chance for Indiana to make a statement. Michigan State takes on Baylor and Detroit. Aaron, if Michigan State's ever going to get this thing back on track, they really need to beat Baylor. If Michigan State doesn't beat Baylor, they will go into conference play far out of the NCAA tournament equation. I'm sorry. Nope, nope. Michigan State at four and six, I don't care who you are. If you're four and six, you ain't making the tournament. (laughs) Um, Ohio State plays UCLA. Huge game in Atlanta. Purdue and Arizona from Indianapolis. I mean, that's a game for the Big Ten. If you're Purdue, you really want to find a way to win that game. And then Sunday, Nebraska takes on Kansas State. That's a very winnable game for Nebraska, but can they travel and show it? Michigan still takes on Florida and Charlotte. But, you know, you just said it. The opportunities, there's not a ton more marquee opportunities for this league. Um I think it's important for this league to be able to collect non-conference results this weekend. I think Illinois plays Missouri on December 22nd. Rutgers has Mississippi State December 23rd. Those games are really important for the Big Ten because those are the games that typically decide whether you are on the right side of a bubble or the wrong side of a bubble. And you look right now just at Kempom, which I I use Kempom for a lot of, of what I'm looking at with teams. This league has three Kempom top 15. From there, Ohio State 27, Michigan State 35, Northwestern 41, Michigan 42. So, you know, Rutgers still has some work to do. I think they can do it. I think that Mississippi State game, if they can get that one, you look at non-conference and you say, all right, things are in a solid enough place. Now let's get double-digit conference wins. Yeah, great points all around. And uh, just a couple more for you. I wanted to pick your brain just in terms of Rutgers and the momentum they have on the recruiting trail. 
uh, for 2024. Obviously, we, we don't want to look too far ahead with the excitement of this current team, um, but just what they've been able to do on the recruiting trail. Uh, Dylan Harper, Ace Bailey, Leighton Somerville, uh, number three uh, ranked class right now, plus with some of the new guys, younger guys they have, Gavin Griffiths, Jermichael Davis. How excited are you to see this team next year? Well, as Mike Dabney said at the Hardwood Classic Banquet last week, the dream is on for a Final Four. Uh, let, let's run it back like we did in 76 because this is a program right now that can dream big. Why wouldn't you? Uh, when you think about what they just had, the news of last week with Dylan Harper, it had been rumored, and uh, for it to now happen is massive for this program. I mean, I, I just think more than anything, Aaron, I put this out on Twitter last week, and it, and it did big numbers for a good reason. You're looking at the 2024 recruiting class rankings. And it's Duke, Kentucky, Rutgers University. That's incredible. That is incredible on the banks. Rutgers games will be an event. They're going to be hard to get into. It's a good thing if you're a media member because you can get into them. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest here. And it is. It, this is going to be a national story in college basketball. What do I think of their core? I mean, the reason why I think they can have something really special next year isn't just because of a freshman. It's because of all that they could have returning. So if it was just Dylan Harper and Ace Bailey, I'd say, okay, do they have to hit the portal hard? Do they have to do this? Like, look, they're going to have some things on their roster to address with Cliff Amore being done and for, for all intents and purposes likely being done because he still could come back, right? Right. Yep. But he has one year left. Yep. I kind of – I mean, I think he's probably in a place where he's – by the end of the year, I think he will have done everything he could have, and, and it might be best for him to go pro. Hope Maybe he does come back, and if he does, that's great for Rutgers. We'll see how that evolves. But for me, you look at the, these freshmen right now, Griffiths, Davis, Simpson's still around. If Steve Peichel can keep the majority of this score together, like why can't this team be top 20 good and, and making a deep, deep run next season? I think everything's possible in Piscataway. It's great for New Jersey. It's awesome for college hoops. It's refreshing in the Big Ten to have Rutgers with this brand power and with these star names. And, of course, you got to win. But here's the thing. There's a winning foundation. And what I love about these two kids that have committed, Harper and Bailey, is that they care about winning. Dylan Harper is Ron Jr.'s younger brother. What did Ron Harper Jr. care about? Winning. 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 And Ace Bailey, I think he's even better than Dylan today. You know, and that's nothing against Dylan at all. But I think Ace Bailey has a chance to be the best out of this class. So I love this group. Yeah, great points there. And it's funny to see, uh, as a Rutgers fan, to see, you know, Indiana fans, Duke fans kind of freak out a little bit and, you know, question why it's happening. And, um, you know, I look at it as these are two guys that are elite talents that have immense confidence in themselves to go to a program where they want to be, you know, they want to be remembered. Uh, they could go to a lot of great programs and be a, a, long, a long list of great players. Uh, coming to Rutgers, they know it will be different and be special if they can have success there. Uh, I guess as a national college basketball uh, media person, uh, how exciting is, is a program, not just that it's Rutgers, but a program that you know isn't traditionally great to have this type of opportunity uh, and to see elite recruits go to a program and, and put them on the map, so to speak, uh, on the national landscape. Well, selfishly, I'm, I'm a New Jersey guy, so I can't wait to get to Jersey Mike's arena more. I wish I got there even more now. I'm going to try to get there as much as I can during Big Ten play. But, you know, I think it's huge. I mean, you're, you're close enough to New York City. I'm really curious, Aaron, to see what multi-team events, what one-off events, are now going to be calling Steve Peichel and saying, do you want to play this game at the Garden? hey, we can make this game happen at MSG. We can make this game happen at Barclays, however it goes. Mm -hmm. Rutgers is now going to be getting those phone calls, and a lot of them. So they are a national brand. So what does it mean? I think it means everything. It's awesome in every way. This is, you know, this is shades of Phil Sellers. What if he was playing when social media was around, and God bless Phil. I, I'd like to think right now he's in heaven smiling down 
on the program and thinking this is what I want because he's Rutgers. He bleeds scarlet. Uh, for me, it, it is fantastic. It's great for everybody involved. Again, it's refreshing to cover somebody not named Duke or Kentucky or Carolina. I can't wait to see what, what Rutgers does with all this. It's a golden opportunity for them to show the world the power of this university, the power of this fan base, the power of this program. Well, John Fanta, it's always a pleasure to talk college basketball with you, and it really helps to have someone of your uh, expertise speak so positively about Rutgers. Fans just don't hear it from me, but they hear it from you that that lived it and saw it on Saturday, uh, and also your appreciation for the rivalry. It's, it's just great to have you a part of it now, and thank you so much for your time and your great insight once again. Aaron, thank you for having me. Love what you do. Scarlet Faithful is a great show, and I'll tell you what. Uh, Steve Peichel, to me, has done as good of a building job with Rutgers that you'll find in college hoops, and it's just getting started. So happy to come on your show anytime. Congrats to you on all that you've done. Thank you, John. And, uh, you know, uh, music to Rutgers fans' ears. And I think the be the better, as Steve Peichel always likes to say, better days, are, you know, are on the way. And I think that is very true of this program. And thank you for all your time once again. Thank you, Aaron.